folks welcome back to shifting schools podcast my name is trisha friedman jeff was unable to make this episode and i know he's going to be jealous because on the show today we are speaking with educator maya bialik who is a seventh grade science teacher from boston and the founder of question well ai this episode is going to explore that tool and how teachers like you can make use of it in the decades since earning her master's degree in mind, brain, and education from Harvard, Maya has worked directly with educators and jurisdictions around the world on many parts of the education system, from writing curriculum to evaluating programs, running professional development, facilitating seminars and workshops, designing new standards, conducting research, and publishing books and papers on both primary research and theoretical frameworks. It's a joy to be speaking with Maya in this conversation. I think by the end of it, you're going to be pretty excited to tinker with question well. So please know that links are over there in the show notes for you to find that free tool as well as to learn more about Maya herself. I do want to leave you a reminder that all month long, if you listener are the first to leave us a review on Apple or Spotify podcasts, uh, we are granting that first person from the state or country this month a free access to our all access AI pathway. You can learn more about that over on Shifting Schools. So that's our little way of saying thank you to those of you who have taken the time to leave us a review. If you've got questions about that learning pathway or about our upcoming three week uh, AI PLC group that kicks off this January. Again, you can learn more at shiftingschools.com or by leaving Jeff and I a message. You can write to us um, at info at shiftingschools.com. Again, our email address will be over there in the show notes. Now, please welcome to the show, Maya. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. I'd love to start our conversation with a book that you co-authored way back in 2019, which is entitled Artificial Intelligence in Education, Promises and Implications for Teaching and Learning. This means that, you know, it's not just ChatGPT that got you interested in AI, but you've been interested for years now um, thinking about what schools need to reconsider in order to be more relevant for students. Um, as generative AI has come onto the stage in a very big way this past year, what questions do you want to see more educators grapple with when it comes to the student learning experience and AI? Yeah. Um, so the book that I wrote in 2019 was really uh, based on what we knew in 2019. So um, that took the work that we had been doing at Center for Curriculum Redesign about asking ourselves, what do students need to know? and learn to be successful for the 21st century. Um, and the answer was sort of a mix of knowledge, what we know and understand, as well as higher order thinking, critical thinking skills, critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, as well as the next level up, which is sort of the social emotional character dimension. And then finally, this fourth dimension of meta learning. So it was situated in that um, kind of line of thinking. And a huge part of the book was just an overview of what existed at the time. But the other half of the book was how do we rethink knowledge, the role of knowledge, the structure of knowledge and how we teach it in schools. Um, and the main idea there was really looking for the concepts uh, because understanding the concept is what will allow that knowledge to transfer to new situations. Uh, we're not really training people to do the exact thing that we're teaching them where we have to be teaching them for a world that doesn't exist yet. Um, so that was the general idea with that. And I think that all still applies, but we're in a totally different uh, 
situation now. Um, and I think that brings up a lot of new questions. So I'm working on a new book, but uh, no more uh, details on that yet. Um, I would say in terms of what I want to see educators grapple with more is um, right now I'm seeing a lot of like, is it cheating to use AI? And I just want to say right away, no. <laughs> um, if, you know, I see that we're looking at students using AI and saying that's cheating. Um, and that's because students are learning. <laughs> so they're really cheating themselves out of their learning. Um, as teachers, we are working. So although we learn along the way, we're really trying to do the best job that we possibly can and uh, elevate student learning. So using a tool to do better at your job is something every single other profession has done. It makes us, in my view, more professional rather than less. Um, so. I'm looking for educators who are asking themselves, what do I want my process to look like? So as going into the classroom, I've seen, I saw this before when I worked with teachers as a researcher, but I've been teaching the last few years. This is my third year teaching, and I see it even more sort of firsthand. Creating a process of how you prepare and do and reflect on your teaching um, there's an infinite number of ways to do it. And so part of the art that is teaching, the artistic choices are how you choose to Frankenstein the different pieces together. Um, and so now that we have all of these different, like just a huge explosion in the number of tools, I think a great question for educators to ask themselves is, okay, how do I, which parts of my current process do I want to augment? Um, because it's not going to be to do a whole new thing. You might try that once and then never do it again. Um, it's more about, okay, I've found painstakingly, I've found what works for me. How do I make that even better? And then the last step is just, what are my aspirations? What is it that I wish I could do? Why did I get into teaching? What is it that I wish I could do that I just never have time for because I'm busy doing all this stuff? And if this is going to save me time, what do I want to use that extra time for? Is it, and then we come back to some of the original thinking, is it critical thinking? Is it creativity? If it becomes like the sky's the limit um, in terms of just your imagination and what you hope and wish uh, and believe teaching should be. And I think that we've in the past just been so stuck in the grind that we haven't been able to like, take a breath and ask ourselves these questions. And I think this is a beautiful opportunity to do that. What you're saying resonates so strongly with me um, in part because a lot of the trainings that we do at Shifting Schools with teachers is about that experimentation. And also I really appreciate you using the phrase artistic choices because they are, and it's an art and a craft that doesn't always get the respect that it deserves. Um, and that piece about aspirations, you know, for me, one of the best ways I think to look at this is pick a subject that you struggled in personally when you were a student. You know, for me, math was always really hard. So even a task that's as simple, and this is inspired by, there's a great wired YouTube playlist called Five Levels, where they have an expert, they take a complex concept, and they break it down, you know, kindergarten level, fifth grade level, high school level, uh, graduate expert, uh, to see how, you know, like, what's, what's the difference between understanding as you go up that ladder? <clears throat> and so I might take something yeah. like a fractal break down a fractal at the first grade level, jump up a few grade levels. Um, and then the other thing I've been playing around with is inviting something like chat GPT. Can you also explain to a dog what a, what a fractal is? Um, and then <laughs> that got me thinking more creatively. Can you explain to an antique chair what a fractal is? And so the the examples are really interesting and creative. And for me, like I always loved language arts and that gets me really curious about fractals, right? So I'm thinking if I could have gone back in yeah. time and had access to, you know, not every teacher is going to be able to give all that personalized support to every single student. Now we have some of those tools that actually it's pretty quick and easy to, you know, in the examples that I gave, what I'll also invite teachers to do is not just explain the concept to a third grade student, 
a third grade student who loves The Legend of Zelda. So it, you know, it kind of incorporates yes. that. And that is so amazing and powerful. So you're right. This conversation around cheating, I wish we flipped that narrative and we were saying, if we're not digging into kind of the differentiation opportunities here, what is that cheating our students out of? Um, yes, you know, exactly. Uh, and, and it really is. And I love. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I love that you bring that up. I haven't heard and I completely agree. I think people talk about differentiating as making it easier or harder. And that's fine. <laughs> but I think there are certain um, subjects that we're naturally intrinsically more curious about and others that we're naturally intrinsically less curious about just at face value, just immediately presented in a general way that you presented to ev the whole class as a whole. Um, and then if you could identify those and build on the curiosity, we talk so much about curiosity and how, and it's so hard to actually cultivate in the classroom. Um, if I could be taught history through psychology and sociology, they're not even that far apart. <laughs> and, you know, it's not even like, and I like cats, which would also work. But like, I personally had a hard time getting engaged in history um, when I was in school. And in senior year, we were able to replace it with psychology. And I was like, why couldn't we have just done it that way? I would have been so engaged from the very beginning and all that knowledge would have built up and I would have basically had a depth of knowledge um, in addition to the breadth that sort of typical K-12 curriculum has to default to offering. I love that. I think you're right. Curiosity is such a strong catalyst for learning. And I, I would love to see more of that conversation around how are these tools, you know, going to really like light that curiosity spark. Um, Maya, you recently mm -hmm. spoke at a conference on ed tech and the title of your session, speaking of curiosity, kind of like piqued mine. The title was the age of super teachers, AI tools for augmenting educator impact. Tell us more about that session and, and perhaps let us know with how it connects with some of your other interests. Um, I know that you have included sort of play-based learning and science communication as some of the other areas of interest for you. Yeah, um, that was a very fun session. I was on a panel with uh, the founder of TeachFX and the founder uh, of Noodle Factory. And I was there sort of as the founder of QuestionWell AI, which is... Um, an AI tool for teachers that my husband and I created based on my personal needs as a teacher that has since been taken up by other teachers that had similar needs. But um, we all basically reflected on our visions for how AI can transform teaching. And it was actually, we just kept sort of being very surprised at just how aligned those visions were. Um, and it's pretty related to the conversation we were already just starting to have. But I think the way in which it connects to some of these ideas from education that you wouldn't necessarily immediately connect it to. So it's a technology, naturally you'd connect it to technology, but in some ways it can bring us back to the more, the less technological um, teaching tools uh, and technologies. So a discussion uh, that can be extremely augmented. And basically if the tech is taking care of the tech, now you and I can take care of the people processes. Um, the other way I think I'm very interested in what AI can help with is creating low stakes environments. In some ways, the high stakes environments in schools, not uh, putting aside standardized testing, just within the school, um, has to do with the fact that it takes so many, so much resources to create the materials. And if it takes basically rounding down to zero <laughs> resources or just very few or 10 times less resources to create these materials, we can actually just have lower stakes learning everywhere. And my background is in neuroscience, um, applying that to education. And that is just very, very clear based on the research that when you are more nervous, your thinking narrows, your fight or flight, your cortisol levels go up, it becomes much harder to think and learn. And so creating low stakes environments is absolutely crucial to learning. Um, learning in a high stakes environment, you're kind of learning despite <laughs> the high stakes. So um, for example, like with question while AI, one of the main ways that I use it is 
uh, the way it works is you put in a reading or a URL or a video or whatever, and the AI writes questions for you. Um, and you can then export those questions to Canvas, to Kahoot, to quizzes, to like 15 other things. And so um, the way I love using that is just creating an infinite amount of practice questions. Um, and so even for tests, I will say, okay, you get two retakes. You get your first try and then you get two more tries. And you can study in between them. And so this is this comes from when I first started teaching and one of my main um, surprises going into the classroom coming from research was the way that testing absolutely warps learning immediately. Like any glimmer of evaluation completely sort of takes over um, any learning that would have been happening. So I just, I'll never forget my first day or so I taught something, I gave them two questions just to check their understanding. Um, and as they were walking out, a student said, don't tell my mom I'm failing science. And I was like, literally, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, it, our only grade so far is these two questions that you gave. And I got one right and I got one wrong. That's 50% and that's failing. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, no. And the poor student was like, wait, but one out of two is 50%, right? And I'm like, yes, but no. <laughs> um, the poor thing was just like so, so affected by this. Like this was front of mind above the learning that was supposed to be taking place right off the bat. So for that reason, and whenever I give a test, they're like, how many retakes will there be? Blah, blah, blah. Is it multiple choice? So I like to use it to create their what they ask me for in terms of learning. They ask me for a lot of tries and multiple choice. And so I create that for them. And because they're middle school boys, they, uh, <laughs> at first they would, they'd take the first try, they'd get their score without studying. They'd say, ah, I got two more tries. I'll take this. I'll take my shot at the second one, get the same score. <laughs> I'll say, you know, I only have one more try. Maybe I'll study. <laughs> so they go home and they study and they study the actual things that they realize that they didn't understand. And then they get, they actually understand it. And that's really mastery learning. That's like where I get very excited because the point isn't to punish them for not having studied the first time. Um, if you want, you can have separate standards. Like we have a separate grade for academic habits. Like that's separate from, do you understand it? Do you ultimately understand it? Like we're not punishing you for being slow um, or lazy when we give you a grade for your knowledge, for your understanding. We ultimately want to know not on average how bad were you in getting there, but now how much have you mastered it and really rewarding the learning itself um, rather than punishing the process. And it's fascinating um, to me. You one know, more thing. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to mention, you know, no, you it, it's interesting you mentioned in that anecdote about that student, how many students already, you know, not by an old age, but by an early age have already, you know, kind of as sponges absorb this message about assessment that like, we're trying to catch you, mm -hmm. you know, or it's punitive. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said about <clears throat> you know, we, we actually want you to feel engaged in the learning and supported in the learning. And I think that's also kind of the unsung hero of generative AI right now is, you know, those executive function skill sets. So, yeah. you know, especially with middle schoolers, something that as a longtime educator, you know, a lot of students needed more support with how do I build a study schedule or routines or, you know, incorporate something like the Pomodoro method? You know, if I've got a big week of assessment coming up and if I have a hundred students, I can't create or I couldn't create a bespoke, you know, schedule for every single one of them factoring in uh, their different, um, you know, subject areas, hobbies, all of those things. But now, actually, with generative AI, we can also help students. Like, here's how you can create that rough draft schedule with a few little, mm -hmm. like, nudge review follow up questions, even some SEL incorporated breaks into that. So, I'm also really curious to see where this takes us. In you're right, like, the knowledge and content and understanding is one part, but the actual learning to learn is another focus where yeah. all of a sudden we've got this incredible scaffolding tool 
um, that we can use to put those two pieces together. Because it might be that I have all this knowledge and understanding, but you're right. Unfortunately, sometimes, especially, you know, summative assessment, my heartbeat goes up, my pulse is, is kind of, um, you know, so even just that I can create my own practice quizzes or tests um, and build my capacity for that. It is like supercharging the learning, the learning process. I'd love to talk a little bit more about question well, you know, as founder, uh, you know, I, I would love for you to tell listeners a little bit about your journey in developing that tool. Like when did you have kind of the recognition of this is a problem that I want to address and here's maybe how I can actually create this. Uh, was it sort of a, an aha moment or had this been on your back burner for a while? What was the inspiration for question? Well, yeah, well, um, of course, when, <clears throat> um, ChatGPT came out about a year ago, um, I was very excited since I had already been looking at AI and education and I was kind of like, it's happening. <laughs> what do I want to do? Um, and so, but like, Nothing was really uh, clicking into place um, until it was February vacation this year. And I was working alongside my husband and he was playing around with AI um, and I was writing questions for practice questions. And after a few hours of this, he's like, hey, come check out what I made. Um, it reads like a blurb and then it creates tri trivia questions. Isn't that fun? And here I had been sitting by hand doing the exact same thing. And he was like, surprise, here's an endless supply of these. And he did not know that that's what I had been working on. It was just kind of this moment of like, okay, let me show you what I've been working on. <laughs> um, these kind of go together. And so we got very excited because basically then he was like, wait, I would never stand for this. Like if this was my job, I'd, that's, that's so much work. Um, as somebody who, who's a technologist and he would just automate everything. And he's like, you're telling me you have to copy and paste and write these from scratch and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, mm-hmm. And so, and so, uh, together, that's where we came up with this idea. And I was, I really, as you might guess, like enjoy playing around with different tools. So I had tried quizzes, Kahoot, every single one, all, every single one of these. And so, it was pretty easy to make it export to every single one of them um, because based on the day, I would kind of have a different feeling of which one I wanted to use. Um, and so we kind of make a, made a working prototype um, pretty quickly. And then um, pretty quickly we opened it up to people and just mostly through people on TikTok, honestly, uh, who are excited about sharing how they were using it, it kind of gained steam. And that's, that's where we are now just kind of steadily growing. So that's been really, really fun. Um, I love collaboration. So that's been fun to do uh, with my husband. And um, I've really enjoyed sort of seeing where it goes and applying both my expertises. So on the one hand, my teaching experience, which Without it, I never would have gone down this exact path. I think I would have maybe been more like higher level here, all the possibilities. Um, but with my, as a teacher, I was like, this is a problem I need to solve now for tomorrow. Um, and then at the same time, using my higher level, um, you know, 10,000 foot view hat of um, what makes a good question, what makes a good essential question, breaking that all down in order to write the prompt. Um, you have to really articulate it and break it down and iteratively improve um, and sort of ask myself, okay, in some ways, the medium is the message. So the way that I make the tool communicates what I think is good education, good teaching. And so I think a lot about that. And I really enjoy putting on my sort of researcher hat um, for that as well, like improving the quality um, and not just the lowest possible, like, you know, it's better than nothing. Moving it up to the next level and sort of helping teachers, boosting them even higher. So it's like more impact for even less work, um, like improving that ROI from both sides. Um, and that's been really, really fun. 
Oh, oh, and um, the other thing of that I so in my school where I teach now, we don't um, have to really talk about standards or anything like that. It's it's pretty loose. Um, but from my previous work, I had worked on standards a lot, and so I was very interested in tying standards to the questions, and that ended up being another thing that was very useful and some a place that I'm super interested for where AI can help because it's so much language manipulation. Um, it seems just like a perfect fit for that. Thank you so much for for sharing that story. There's so much to that. You know, the collaborative piece, the making transparent what we're working on, right? Like just how even that conversation is really important. And then the empathy piece of realizing the average teacher, like I think if you work in education, you're sort of doing like a dozen jobs simultaneously, right? Uh, There's so much going on in the average day. So even just giving somebody access to one incredible box of tools, which is high quality questions in your case, you know, how that's going to save them some time and energy and allow us, as you were talking about earlier, to focus on some of the human centered things, right? Because if I'm exhausted Mm -hmm. because I've been up all night creating a question bank, my energy is going to be lower the next day. All of those one-to-one conversations that my students need me to have it's harder to do that when we're exhausted, right? We know that. So exactly, I really think we, we shouldn't underestimate what it's going to mean to save that time and energy and just how incredibly impactful that is. Uh, Maya, I'm wondering if in closing, though, <coughs> you can touch on something that you kind of casually mentioned that I'm always really fascinated with in that you were sharing on TikTok. So you know, TikTok is a space that for me, it's like mainly just my dog videos, but I'm really interested in what folks are doing in terms of like citizen journalism. Um, you know, it is, I, I think sometimes I, I speak to other teachers and they think it's either just dance videos or just junk. And actually, uh, you know, I've, I've also followed some sort of like CTE work and looking at how, you know, that's an industry that really needs more folks. And there's a lot of people out there talking about like, here's actually why I love being an electrician and walking through like, what does an electrician do? And I think, gosh, you know, Mm. if I had been 16 and had access to something like that, that might've been like a career path that I would have thought about that I never thought about when I was at that age. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you just want to speak a little bit more to either social media or if there's a different tool that, you know, for you as an entrepreneur, as a founder, uh, you're thinking, maybe for those teachers of entrepreneurship or business, why, why are the, these tools actually maybe a little bit more essential than somebody would assume at first glance? Hmm. Well, TikTok is very interesting because their algorithm is something we hadn't seen before. Um, it really figures out what you're interested in and serves you more of that. So people who say it's mostly junk or just dance videos, all that is, is that's the, average that it drops you into and uh after that you have to sort of show it what you like so i first i had that reaction at first and i gave up and then my younger sister explained this to me and sent me some videos that i would actually like uh and then since then it's just been amazing it's teacher teaching videos technology linguistics music um home improvement and of course kittens but (laughs) that that's for everybody um and so I just find it like very inspiring. Um, but that's because I, that's sort of what I seek out. So it, it's kind of a reflection. Um, it shows you back at you the kind of things that you behaviorally empirically appear to be interested in. So I think that's very interesting. Um, even just as a tool for reflection, like comparing mine to my husband's is very funny. Um, his is like more similar to the like, the young men that I teach. <laughs> um, and even right away, uh, his was like, this is the, the cockpit of a plane. And I'm like, that's very cool. <laughs> They're just so different. Um, and his are all very short and mine are all very long. Um, so it's a, it's a tool for reflection. And then it's also like connecting you to those exact people that are interested in your exact thing. So there's a lot of like niche, um, like, 
like double niche, triple niche, like you're interested in these three specific things. And here are all the people interested in all three of those things. <laughs> so it can really connect you to your audience in a way and your like user base. And so in that way, it can also help spread messages faster. Um, you do have to sort of know how to use it. And I do not. Um, so I've been very lucky that uh, other teacher influencers um, and just teacher talk um, as a whole has been very, I mean, the kinds of people making these videos tend to be the kinds of people that are open to new experiences. And so they are go, they're really like expanding our thinking. And then as a group, our thinking evolves together. And so I've been very lucky that they kind of, pointed out question while pretty early on and got that message out. Um, and that was really like, I didn't do anything <laughs> to make that happen. Um, which was really, really lovely. And then since then people are aware and they reach out and, um, say I'm running a PD, uh, on question while. And so that's been really, really helpful in getting the word out. And I think it's just having that insight on what, the audience actually is interested in actually wants actually needs. That's the main thing. Like it's not really about marketing something that nobody wants or marketing something that th this audience doesn't want. It's having the product find its audience. Um, and so, and sort of doing that matchmaking. And so this algorithm, like where we're at with it now is, is really in an unprecedented place of doing that matching. Um, and then, I think I just want to jump back to um, AI possibly enabling more human human connections. Um, there was some, so I'm currently working on <laughs> um, having, uh, if you get like the school version, um, you and the other teachers that teach sort of the same thing can share a class and can share question sets within that class. And so, I'm super interested. It's we tend to just have no time at all in school. And I'd love to be able to collaborate with teachers, but it seems impossible. So that's one thing I'm really, really curious about now is um, facilitating that collaboration across teachers. And one thing I think that is special about it being AI is that it's a lot easier to collaborate where you're when you're not like insulting anyone. You're insulting a machine. Um, and so we can look at these questions that I wrote and then you're probably going to be kind of polite. Um, or we could both look at these questions that the AI wrote and really take them, be critical and constructive and take them to the next level, knowing we're not going to hurt each other's feelings. This is written by an AI. And so this is another example of the technology actually making our human connection more human. And it's also another sort of making something that's kind of feels high stakes, feeling more low stakes. Um, and it even happened with my students. So at one point I came in, I was like all ready to do this lab. I'm a science teacher. And, uh, I was like, great. Where are the materials? I left them here. Um, oh, they were thrown out by accident over the summer. Um, <laughs> and that is what I planned for the day. So, um, I quickly took a YouTube video, put it into question well, and I showed the students. I was like, guys, this is, these questions are going to be made by AI. Like, let's evaluate them together if they're any good or not. Um, so we watched the video and I was like, what do you want to do? Look it. And they're like, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I quickly made up look it. And then it was really fun. The sort of dynamic of teacher, student, power, dynamic, difficult, uh, sort of frustrating, tense, like at times in ways relationship completely flipped. And it was us together against the AI in a way. So they would say, wait a minute, this isn't exactly right. Like two of those answers are correct. And then I'd be like, yeah, hey. <laughs> and so like we could together critique it um, rather than like if they find a mistake in my work, you know, they have to really carefully be like, excuse me, here's a mistake. And I'm like, yes, you're right. And you know, it's like this power dynamic rather than like together exploring the material, checking our understanding um, and especially checking our, our understanding against a flawed uh, process um, has been really fun because you kind of feel like, yeah, we're right and it's wrong. And the thing that's wrong doesn't actually take offense of being wrong. <laughs> so, um, so that was a really fun dynamic as well.
You you pointed out something that I had not even thought about before. And yes, like the great value of having a rough draft partner with no feelings or sensitivities has shown up in many of the conversations that I've had. Um, I'm a big basketball fan. And so something that I've been really enjoying doing with ChatGPT is uh, you know, if it's a unit or a topic, what I'll ask is for ChatGPT to generate a March Madness style bracket of like core concepts, mm-hmm. you know, match them up based on this and then also predict the winners. And it's a great, again, getting back to how this is really good for conversation, the stuff that students love, that we love, that's the human aspect of education. When we've been kind of debriefing who it determined as the winners, if we had done that rough draft, it would have been more difficult to really get in there and give the hard critique. But because it's like, this is our emotionless rough draft partner, we could really get in there and have that hot debate. And yes, like it's, it's, it's no offense. It's just sort of, it like removes that initial barrier. And I had never thought about that value before. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Maya, I know that there will be listeners who are curious about Question Well, how they can explore it. So somebody who's listening and is thinking, okay, <clears throat> trying new tools is always, as you said, like sometimes that feels high stakes for somebody who is going to take the plunge and try out your tool. What would you recommend to somebody completely new to Question Well? Like, Can you just kind of walk them through that experience of, of getting started and what that experience is? should look and could feel like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I would think that it it would come about when you have some questions that you're trying to prepare, whether it's for a test or practice questions or discussion questions, you're working on something. Um, I think it works best to demonstrate when you actually have like a real goal. And like the example that's already in there filled in for you is what I was genuinely working on over February break. Um, And so having that real example that's helpful to you will help you evaluate whether it's creating something that you would find useful. Um, And then you would go in and there's a few different things you can do. Um, You can paste in a reading. You can get that from Nuzella. You can get it from an article you were going to have them read, a textbook, anything you want. Um, And that context will really help the AI to write questions that are relevant to what you want. You can also just paste in a URL and it will pull out the reading or YouTube video. As long as it has captions, will pull out the captions. Um, And so basically giving that context or you can also um, in the paid version, you can upload some documents. But um, the context is really important. And it's interesting because it's a little bit more work for you to find this context. But the outcome becomes, you know, rather than just typing in a topic and hitting go. But the outcome becomes actually helpful (laughs) to you and what you specifically are trying to accomplish. Um, So and then if you are working in school with um, standards that you have to cover or you're you just have learning outcomes for whatever reason that you would love for this to cover, definitely make sure to write those in because that helps the AI, again, write questions that are really going to be helpful to you and not just questions on the topic in general. Um, And so. Once you put that in, you can also do different languages. So if you're a language teacher, you are in a different country, anything like that, that's a quick drop down. Um, and just maybe today we're going to add reading levels. So if it's generating um, a text uh, or if you are giving it a text, it, you can change the reading level right there. Uh, hopefully today <laughs> that might be a little uh, uh, imperfect for a little while. Um, but then you hit generate and then there's a, an adorable animation of a robot. That was my giant contribution since I don't know how to code. <laughs> and so you give it a minute or a couple minutes and it generates these questions. And from there, you can use the learning outcomes to filter the questions. So you can see which questions are actually trying to assess which learning outcome. Um, you can look at the vocabulary that it pulled out and do something based on vocabulary. You can look at the essential questions. Um, I will say that they are, you know, if you're really, really um, strict about certain definitions of essential questions, they don't fall, they don't like 
fall under every definition of essential questions, but there are these slightly deeper, more open-ended questions that you can use in the classroom as discussion questions, or just get yourself thinking again, like you might think that's a terrible essential question. Here's what it should be. And that's great. It's done its job. Um, and then you can also export. So for the full list, just go on there. None of it is behind a paywall. You can just export to any of them that you wish. Um, and if there's one that you'd like to export to that we don't export to, just send me an email. Um, and that ideally can happen pretty easily. So from there you export. Um, and if you're not sure, there's a little like help icon. So each one has a little quick um, how to, if you're not sure, if it's not totally self-explanatory um, for actually uploading it to the website of your choice. And then from there, you're back into your regular flow. You're back into your teacher workflow that you have, like we were saying at the beginning, you've made these artistic choices, you've found the process that works for you. This just adds this initial step that takes something that would have taken an hour and makes it take a few minutes. And then you do have to read through the questions and make sure that they are good. And it's really not perfect. Um, again, it's a first draft. And so uh, revel in the fact that you're smarter than it <laughs> and uh, improve the questions. You can actually edit them right there. So um, before you export and then as you go, like if you feel like adding more bells and whistles, all of that was free. If you feel like adding more bells and whistles, there's a paid version. And if your colleagues want to work with you, you can set up a, a school's version. Um, but all of that comes later. Like the core, since I'm coming from nonprofits and I am a teacher myself, the core of it, and the thing that I actually needed um, without the extra bells and whistles, that is all free. Um, so you can absolutely with no limits. So anyone listening now can absolutely just go on there um, with the topic that they need uh, questions for and just see how it works, see how it goes. Fantastic. Maya, at the time of our recording, um, Common Sense Media has recently come out with they are going to be doing reviews of different AI tools. Uh, they kind of have criteria that they've come up with. And one of the core pieces of advice that Shifting Schools has been giving to different schools is have a student leadership team that's also talking about the different mm -hmm. tools and the impact that they see. Because as we're talking about AI in education, if you're not listening to student voice, um, you need to ask yourself, why not? Because they will have some really powerful insight. So if there's a listener who is saying, you know what, like, let's get a student group looking at this tool um, and also kind of talking about, you know, your point about the power of a first draft is, is major. Um, and so I could see some older students also using it for work that they're doing. If there's a student group that would like to reach out to you, um, either to give you feedback or to talk about like what this means for their learning or again, teachers of business, entrepreneurship, like I think Maya would make for such a great interview for your students. Also, if a student group would like to connect with you, what is the best way for them to go about doing that? And if they are going to do a review, is there a certain aspect of the tool that at the time of this recording, you're thinking, I would love to know the student perspective on this aspect? Yeah, absolutely. Please reach out. I was a student that wanted to give my opinion. So I really would appreciate that. Um, my email is just my at questionwell.ai. And I have worked with some students in the school that I teach, actually. Um, they sort of came to me and that's been really fun. And then I'm also just experimenting in my classroom. So I just gave this project assignment and with like a choice board, you can do a presentation, you can do a video, whatever, et cetera. Um, and you can do a, a student suggested a parody song. I was like, 100%. Yes, you can do a parody song. But then another student was like, I actually also wanted to do a parody song, but I don't feel comfortable singing. Can I use AI to sing for me? And I was like, yes, absolutely. And I had another student ask another AI question. I was like, okay, we're updating the project. Here are the rules for using AI. You absolutely can use AI. The rules are, one, you can't use it for every part of the project. Um, choose, pick and choose which parts you're going to do and which parts the AI is going to do. Um, because of course you learn by doing. So any part you're, the AI is doing for you, you're not learning. And that's not the end of the world. You don't have to get bogged down in learning how to do graphic design. If you want to spend your energy 
figuring out the higher level concept and the deeper empathy and creativity. So um, use it for just one, not the whole thing, <laughs> one part. Um, disclose how you've used it. So the prompt, um, what it gave you, why you changed it, um, which parts it did, which parts you did, and so on. And then the third part is, I will be holding your project to a higher standard. So um, if it took another student 10 hours to, because they chose not to use AI, and that's fine. I will be grading the project accordingly. And if I know, and if you used AI for this part, I'll be holding you to a higher standard, which is great. Like both are valid options. It just depends on what you want to be learning based using this project. Like a project is so open ended. You could learn so many different things to your point earlier about executive function. Um, you're definitely learning executive function and or you could use AI to help with the executive function portion. So every part is sort of a choice. Do you want to be learning this right now or do you want help with that and to be learning a different thing? Um, if you get help with everything, then you're not learning anything. <laughs> but but if you want help with pieces so that you can deeper and better and more calmly learn the other pieces, I think that that's super valid, especially with that reflection piece on top of that. Um, so I would love, love, love to, to hear from students, to speak to students. Um, please reach out if you're even a little curious. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll be sure again to have a uh, link to question. Well, uh, we'll also have your contact information over there at the show notes. Looking forward to continuing to see what you do with question. Well, Maya, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about the opportunities and a few ways to consider embedding AI in the classroom. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you.